Right, quite a mouthful, lean and agile R&D innovation process. So the, at times the uh, presentation might be a little bit abstract. I'll try and uh, make some real things, uh, some actual case study out of this. So I'm going to present a little bit about the South African context, then the need, the approach, and the case study, which makes it all a bit more real, and then a bit of a conclusion out of all of this. Um, so as we uh, know, South Africa is no longer the strongest country in Africa, uh, the, long, the strongest economy. Um, about two years ago, we were surpassed by um, the oil producing Nigeria. Um, doesn't mean that we are in a bad place. It means that somebody has got more natural stuff to sell than we do at this stage. Um, so if you look at, um, I think there's a laser pointer here, and I hope I'm not going to, yes, there you go. Um, so the gray part is sub-Saharan Africa, and the blue part is, is South Africa. Um, as we all know, financial market is really, really strong, but there's a lot of uh, problem areas in our economy as well. It's uh, the labor market efficiency, the innovation is subpar, and Apologies to Erosud, but this is a generalization. Um, then um, the whole aim is to start moving from this factor-driven economy into an, an international uh, innovation-driven economy. So what that means is uh, if you're a factor-driven economy, you rely on your natural resources. You try and, as cheaply as possible, get stuff out of the ground and distribute it worldwide and compete on that basis. Whereas if you're an innovation-driven uh, economy, you tend to try and bring out new products, uh, new services, that sort of thing. You're no longer really focusing on your natural resources. Currently, South Africa is somewhere in the middle, um, and we're trying to grow in this that direction. So we have to um, do more R&D, and uh, really positive news this morning from Cyril Ramaphosa that there's going to be a much bigger R&D budget, so that's good news, um, and good news for the CSR, of course, as well. Um, but that's sort of the, the background of the whole story, and, but we need to grow into the innovation. Um, so the need, and everybody in the CSR has seen these pictures before, we always say the CSR sits somewhere from applied research to maybe development, but not really production or marketing or anything like that. It's a very serialized process. Um, we see the universities as doing the basic research and CSR trying to take that basic research into something that the industry could take over. Um, and it's just something that doesn't really work, and that's part of what this talk is all about, the, the serial approach of the whole thing, but also the fact that CSR traditionally has tended to say, okay, this far and no further. Somebody else must take this further. Okay, so um, this comment about the multiple actors and stakeholders has also got to do with funding. TR is starting to realize that they, I've seen a document from TR that explains very nicely exactly where they fit in as a funder. And to explain that if you want to do basic research, this is the type of funding you get from the NRF. TIA will take it further to this far. And then there's other funding agencies like IDC and things like that that will take your product even further. So the funders are starting to understand that it has to be this cooperative funding landscape in order to make sure that your innovation goes all the way to something that makes makes impact. So, um, there you go. hello. So this is another way of looking at it. Uh, CSR has always been very, very technology driven. Uh, when I joined 99, I've earned a lot of gray hairs here. That was really what CSR was all about. Technology, technology, technology. Never really worried about much else. Um, Yes, we've developed a number of really nice products, but we never were very sure about the users, uh, whether the funders actually appreciated what we were doing and whether what we were doing was actually given impact into the market. So what I'm now going to be talking about is trying to do that whole scheme of things that you actually um, cover the whole market from start to finish. So our approach is lean and agile R&D. And it talks about MVP, 
and that means minimal viable product. I'll talk about just now what it actually means. You use a number of tools to achieve your lean R&D. Um, you're using a business model development called the Business Canvas, and I'll explain a little bit later what that's all exactly about. Uh, you use lean and agile engineering methodologies, and now people will start to sit up and say, oh, this sounds familiar. This is something that software startups use a lot, uh, like Kanban, Scrum, Sprints, all of that sort of stuff. And it's exactly what it's based on, but it's more than that. And what is important is that you might say, this is all very much startup driven, but it isn't really. Uh, there's an example of General Electric, for instance, starting to uh, use these methodologies as well. Um, the story goes, they wanted to develop a new fridge, this is around 2013, and instead of using their traditional methodology of there's a couple of salespeople and they tell the engineers what they want, and then they go away and the engineers do something and give it back to the salespeople, they try to use a different methodology. So they integrated a team of salespeople, engineering, and constant client feedback. So you're constantly busy in a loop of things. You're doing customer development, you're making sure that what that fridge is doing is something that your client actually appreciates, likes it. But the important bit is you keep on doing all of that stuff over and over and over again. Business model, your lean and agile engineering, your customer development, and it just keeps on going. It's not like you write a business model, park it somewhere, forget about it, and continue with your product development, as a lot of people tend to do. So um, this is one of the tools, the business model canvas comes from Dr. Alexander Osterwalder, who is in basically investigated thousands of business plans and tried to find common factors. Um, so uh, the traditional stuff you know about, you want to make sure that your activities and your resources are in place, and you've got your key partners, and all of that together, you're going to make your product very, very nice. Then you must make sure that you've got your channels to get your customers, that you build your relationships with your customers, and at the same time, you want to make sure that your costs are okay and that you're going to get the correct revenue. Now, this tool is basically a checklist. That's all it is. So uh, by researching all of these business plans, you find a number of common factors, and this is just a checking methodology. Am I doing all of the right things at the right time? Um, right. So the question is now, but what is the product? And it's not that little pretty package there. So it's actually your entire solution. So all of the things that make you different, your clients that you've approached, your partners, your the tools, the people you've got on board, the costs that you're controlling, all of those things together. That's your product. That's what makes you unique in the market, and that's what makes you competitive in the market. So MVP, I touched on that earlier. Keep on stealing graphics from international drawers. Um, so MVP is about exciting your client early and making sure that you actually engage with your client and you don't develop something like you've promised, say, a vehicle to a client. And after four years of messing around, finally you have a happy customer. But in the preceding three years, you've got very unhappy people who get something that they can't use, getting impatient with you, the risk that they run away from you, all of that sort of thing. So the methodology of MVP is exciting your customer early with something that he might not exactly like in the first stage, but at least it's a transport means. And then he starts interacting with this client and say, okay, we've done something as we understood it, what do you think? And then the client interacts with you and says, okay, um, I would like something to at least make me stand up straight properly and give me some balance. And eventually, instead of getting a closed thing, you get a nice open top sports car. So you've really excited your client, but the thing is the client has bought into the whole process. They feel ownership in this whole thing. So you excite them over and over and over again. And the end result, and that's why it is a sports car, is usually a better product than your original offering. Okay. Next slide would be nice. Another way of looking at it is uh, just, it's a different graph. So instead of doing bottom up, that you look at feasibility, value, usable, all of that sort of stuff, you do everything in parallel. So 
look at visibility, the value, the usability, and you're starting to delight your client and you just keep on doing that. It's just a different way of uh, showing the whole thing. Um, so then on the customer development side, which is that third bit, um, there's a gentleman by the name of Stephen Blank. He's a uh, associate professor at Stanford. He's written a lot about your, your customer bits. Uh, he's also got some comments on, uh, on MVP. Um, the uh, interesting story he had was he obviously, because he deals in Stanford, he dealt with a technical team within Stanford that wanted to do inspection of crops using hyperspectral cameras, using drones and covering fields and looking at individual plants. And the theory was that if they do that, they can advise the farmers that these plants need extra feeding or you need more irrigation in that area of your field and things like that. So the team had recognized all of that by even discussing this with farmers. Farmers were excited, interested, but the farmers didn't really know what they were going to get. So as a first MVP, they proposed developing a drone. And for that, okay, let's buy a drone. So at least they got that bit right. Let's buy a hyperspectral camera and not develop it. And that's also right. But then they were going to spend a, a quite a number of months writing software that would stitch all of these images together. So Steve Blank had a nice interaction and said, but why don't you just rent a chopper or a helicopter or a, a plane, take his camera and just take some screenshots and then go talk to your farmers and show them, are these the images you're looking for? And once that is done, then you start worrying about your drone development. So it's all about your customer discovery, your customer validation. Are you busy in the right area? This team was thinking specifically about farmers, but they might, through interactions with clients, actually find out that there is a more lucrative area, uh, a different application that the technology might actually work. Um, so instead of building a company like lots of startups do and then start worrying about clients, you do it the other way around. You interact with your clients, you make sure that what you've got to offer and what you plan to start doing actually matches with your market and only then you start building your company. And again, it's an iterative process because you might initially be talking to the wrong clients. So this is how we are approaching it in our group. It's all the same building blocks. It's basically repetition of all the things I've been talking about. The only difference is the regulatory path which we've added. Um, the group that I'm in has got uh, official ISO 9001 uh, certification, not the local, but the official international one. And we've got ISO 13485 as well, which is for medical device development. So we've taken things a bit uh, further in terms of um, regulatory stuff. So you start with your system thinking, proof of concept, your business model con canvas, um, and then you make your first prototype, again, business model canvas. You just keep on iterating system analysis um, and a regulatory analysis. What we're busy with, can we do that within a regulation? What are the, the processes we have to put in place to make sure that the end product actually meets all the regulations? And then it's MVP 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until you finally get to a final product. Okay. So all of this might seem quite abstract. So let me do a bit of a case study. This is one of the projects we've been working on. Um, it's in the mining environment. Um, and let me just explain a little bit of what's going on in South Africa to our international guests as well. Um, mining industry is going down in terms of GDP, um, the, the output that is delivered. It used to be in South Africa that we were number one in gold production. Currently, we're roughly uh, fourth in the world, as far as I understand. So it's not going the right direction. It's also a technology problem. The, the, the mining depths are deeper and deeper. We're at some of the mines down to four and a half kilometers. So quite a challenge to have people working in those environments. So the obvious answer is to do automation automation or roboticize your mine and things like that. You will get a lot of resistance from mines if you say those words. There's a high sensitivity for job losses. So the best approach is to um, try and get into this environment gradually. So you want to um, 
introduce something that makes the miner have a safer job. So in this automation that you introduce uh, does some sort of a safety job. Once the mine is used to that, they start accepting that this automation actually works. Then you introduce something else, and that's what we try to indicate here. This whole uh, infrastructure or different type of models of robots that all cooperate together. So you start with your safety device, but then more and more you start making the miner's job easier until eventually the miner is almost completely removed from the dangerous area or maybe even above ground. So that's the approach in this whole thing. So specifically around safety, um, the traditional cycle as it currently works is you drill holes into the, the rock or the stope as they call it where the, the ore gets mined. That then means they put um, dynamite in these pockets and then everybody has to vacate the mine and that takes quite a while so two to three hours to actually get out of the mine then they blast and it takes another couple of hours just to make things settle so there's dust issues there's seismic activities and all that sort of stuff after that period a small making safe team moves into the mine and very very gingerly tests whether everything is safe and that means with pry bars looking at loose hanging rock and things like that so the project that we did was a safety inspection robot that makes that job a little bit safer for the mines and creates this weather map uh, for the miner that they actually know this is a safe area, not safe area. The making safe team knows beforehand this is a safe area, there we have to do something to make things safer. So um, we've gone through a number of MVPs from a concept of this is the idea till a couple of different models. And every time we've done that, we've uh, built something, we've measured it, and we've learned from the mistakes we've made and we've iterated again and again and again. This is uh, MVP one, uh, which we put together within a year. One of the big challenges in a mining environment is mover mobility. So being able to move, and one of the challenges of the reef, for instance, is that you're moving at a 40 degree angle, which is quite an angle. Then it's muddy, it's rocky, it's everything. So according to international research, this was the way to go, a sort of a legged robot that actually crawls over things. We, uh, like I said, put it together within a, a year. We made an artificial test stop because taking things down in actual mines is not that easy. So we made some testing environments. And then out of all of that stuff came that it works, but not that wonderfully. One of the bigger challenges was actually making it uh, move in smaller increments. And that's what's something that the legs don't really, it's a bit of a chaotic movement. So it just keeps on crawling. And if you want for certain measurements, you want to move ahead one centimeter, this platform won't let you do that. So having learned from that, we got up to MVP two, which is a tracked robot. Um, again, not all singing, dancing, final, uh, because this thing still wouldn't survive a mining environment, but at least we start proving that a tracked solution works better than this lagged solution. We started adding sensors. Uh, again, not mine proof, but to actually start testing whether we can do inspection of the hanging wall. And to do that, we do use two different methodologies. It's a, a tapper device, which is basically a solenoid shoots against rock and from a neural network sounds, uh, the sounds that come back gets analyzed and whether the, loose is, the, the rock is loose or not. Uh, the other tool that we're using is a, uh, a camera, visible light and infrared, very sensitive infrared and the theory there being that your, your cooling air would cool down loose hanging rock slightly uh, and therefore your thermal camera could actually spot the differences. You're talking about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 degrees or something like that. All of this has been proven in test environment. Currently busy with the, uh, the next version, MP, uh, MVP3, we've got a tier proposal in place, having shown what we've done this far, the idea being that we now actually get into the actual mining environment. Okay, um, right, core development stakeholders, obviously really important. All the things that I've been saying, I think the take home lesson, two of them, the one is communi communicate, communicate, communicate with everybody, your engineers, your salespeople, if you have them, 
uh, your marketing people, your clients, everybody has to be in this continuously uh, communication loop. And you start doing things parallel instead of developing something and then throwing it over the wall and hoping that it actually is going to be a success. You keep on iterating, you keep on engaging with your clients. Um, yeah, and Team South Africa approach. Try and include other partners. Don't try and do everything yourself. That's another mistake we, we tend to make in the CSR. Um, we can do everything better. There are other pockets of excellence that can be used. Thanks very much.